So you've got four workouts covering the whole body over a six day period. Having said that, you gotta be flexible. If you need an extra day for recovery, then take an extra day. So it'll become four days over seven. Some people may need even more. You gotta to listen to your body. If you need more days to recover, then you know just extend that cycle into seven days or eight days or whatever you need. Extra negatives are a tool that you can use to increase the intensity. Basically, you've got three phases of strength. The weakest phase is the positive, or the lifting of the weight. That's the weakest phase. The second phase of strength is the static. You're stronger on the static. And then the third phase is the negative. Unfortunately, a lot of people think in terms of just lifting weight. So, for instance, a bench press has lifted the weight to the top. All right, job, job done. Just drop it back down and do another one. They're missing half of the rep, and possibly the most important half of the rep, uh, because uh, more muscle damage occurs on the negative than on the positive. And it's a damage to the muscle that the body repairs that then becomes muscle growth. So you're missing the most important part of the rep if you don't emphasize that negative part. And even when you've gone to failure on the positive part of the exercise, your muscle hasn't gone to true failure because there's still strength left in the negative. So that's why I advise sometimes doing additional negatives at the end of the set. If you've got a training partner, if you're, if you're on a machine and it's safe, for instance, you're doing bench press on a machine, you reach failure, you do a couple of force reps, your positive strength is depleted, you failed, but you've still got something left in the negative. So you can get somebody to raise their weight to the top and lower it slowly down for a couple of reps until you can't control it. That way, you've depleted every you know, every area of the rep. In the off season, a moderate amount of cardio, I think is good for your cardiovascular conditioning. You need some decent amount of cardio to recover between your sets. So 25, 30 minutes, three times a week, moderate cardio, I think is good for some conditioning. It's also good for recovery from the workouts because it help you push in blood around the system. I'll give, get rid of the waste products from the weight workouts. I prefer to do them on days that, that I'm not in the gym. Uh, or if you, you know, if your schedule doesn't permit that and you have to do it on the days you're weight training, I would much prefer to do it away from the weight workout. I've known for years from my own feedback that if you do cardio after weight training, it kind of interferes with the recovery. The priority is recovering from that workout and rebuilding your resources. So it's much better to do your cardio separately. And uh, funnily enough, scientific studies are coming out now and proving this. If you do cardio after weights, your strength gains are less than if you did weights on their own. I do a small amount of ab work, but it's, there's no additional weight. It's just, it's just body weight, short movements, crunches, reverse crunches, leg raises. Of course, if you wanted to get thicker abdominals, you could use extra resistance, but most people don't because aesthetically, you don't want to build too much muscle in, in the midsection because it spoils your shape. So just very controlled, short movements. Basically, abdominals is just to bring these two points together. So sit-ups and so on, not, not the most effective. I found just simple forward crunches and a reverse crunch that where you're bringing your hips up towards your chest and just reversing that movement. That's pretty much all I, all I needed. Sure, you can do it once a week when, when, you're, when you're in a mass cycle, but I wouldn't recommend using extra weights because it's going to build thickness in the obliques and it's going to, you know, it's going to spoil your symmetry. I'll do several sets, just concentrating on the contraction and having more control, especially when you go on stage, controlling your abdominals and, and with the posing and everything. You need to be connected with the muscle to be able to control them. There's a debate, what's better, machines or free weights? Neither, you know, they're both tools that you can use. Uh, as long as you're working a muscle, you're working it to failure. It doesn't particularly matter if it's a machine or a free weight. There's advantages and disadvantages. The advantage with a free weight, of course, we're all built differently. We're all different heights, we're all got different lengths of limbs, different attachments and everything, where a machine is just built in one way. A uh, free weight, when it, if you lift a free weight, and I lift the free weight, it will take a slightly different pathway because our bodies are built differently. So that's the advantage of a free weight. It works with the individual's body where a machine, you're locked into a groove. The advantage of a machine is that you can isolate the muscle without too much in outside involvement, especially if you've got injuries that are very useful and there's more control involved. So if you want to do extra negatives and so on, of course, if you're doing a free weight bench press, it's very awkward to do extra negatives at the end. You'd have to lift the weight to the top and lower it down, and it's just not practical and it's not really safe. Where with a machine, if you're doing a machine bench press, you can get your training partner to lift it at the top and you can control it and it's safe. So 
There's advantages and disadvantages. I use both in my training. I use free weights, I use machines. Uh, you know, the main thing is, as long it's, it's more like the effort that you're putting in rather than the tools that you're using. I've always worked with a training partner just because uh, working to failure, it, it's not practical. If you haven't got a training partner, you at least need a good spotter, somebody that knows what they're doing. If you, you know, if you're going to failure with a, on an incline press with a free weight, for instance, if you've got a failure and there's nobody there spotting you, it's very dangerous. You could get stuck with that weight on your chest. Um, so you need a good training partner, or, or at least, at least a spotter, you know, to assist you uh, in those exercises where it's not safe and practical to do it without a training partner. So for me, they're essential, but. Of course, they, you know, you've got to have a training partner that has the same goals as yourself. I think that's very important. You know, I can give guidelines, but obviously it varies from one person to another depending on their metabolism. I usually start with a protein recommendation. If somebody's training hard and they're trying to build muscle and put on body weight, I would recommend a ballpark like one and a half grams of protein for each pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, for instance, 300 grams of protein a day, that's what you should be aiming for. And uh, <clears throat> your body can only utilize so much protein at one time, and it doesn't stay in your system for very long. So that's why I recommend eating, breaking that protein requirement down into five or six small meals throughout the day. And uh, that's where a protein supplement becomes very important. That's something I've always used since I started training, because to get three, four hundred grams of protein a day from solid food is very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, if you're working and so on, it's, it's not practical to eat chicken breast every couple of hours. So a protein supplement is very useful to get that requirement in. As far as energy requirement, uh, carbohydrates, that's going to vary quite a bit from one individual to another. So I can give you a, you know, a guideline. And uh, basically, if, you, if you're putting on body fat with that level, then you have to bring it down a little bit. If you're not gaining weight, then you have to go up a little bit. Whatever protein level you're taking, times that by one and a half to two. 300 grams of protein a day becomes 450 to 600 grams of carbohydrate a day. That would be a good guideline. And again, break it out throughout the day and keep um, a good source of uh, carbohydrates. You know, fairly complex carbohydrates that are broken down slowly, released into your bloodstream slowly, so you don't get spikes of uh, blood sugar and, and big drops. So we're talking oatmeal, brown rice, sweet potato, vegetables, things like that. You need fats in your diet. There was one time back when I started training where it was just high protein, uh, carbohydrates, and, and super low fat. And I found with a little bit more fat in my diet, definitely my strength went up and uh, I, get, I got better gains. You know, you're going to get dietary fat if you're eating eggs. I wouldn't recommend just eating egg whites. I would throw a few egg yellows in there. Uh, if you take all the yellows out, uh, you're taking some of the aminos away. So let's say you're having 10 egg whites, I would say have, have at least three yolks in there as well. You know, steak, you're going to have natural uh, fats in there. And a couple of tablespoons a day of omega fats, mixed omega fats, to make sure you're getting all the essential fats. Uh, chicken breast, turkey breast. Beef is an excellent source of protein. It's just, you know, um, if it's very high in fat, obviously you don't want that. But you can get, I used to get lean ground beef, almost as lean as chicken breast, and it's a better, more complete source of protein. So beef is a good source as well. So eggs, uh, chicken breast, turkey breast, beef. Fish is fine if you like it, I'm not a big fan myself. And uh, then a protein supplement, those, those are my main sources. I used to train after two meals. So I'd have a big breakfast, you know, oatmeal, eggs and so on. A couple of hours later, I'd have a shake, a protein shake, maybe a, a banana, a small amount of carbohydrates, about an hour to hour and a half before I train. 30 minutes before I train, I'd take a pre-workout, kind of sim stimulant supplement. After training, I would take a small amount of simple, uh, quickly digested protein, like a whey isolate, along with some simple sugars, dextrose, sucrose, it doesn't matter as long as it's simple sugar. Then you're gonna get that insulin reaction. Body's gonna release insulin, and it's gonna help push nutrients towards the muscles that are depleted at that point. And that's a good time to take, uh, you know, extra glutamine, creatine, if, if you're taking creatine, that's an excellent time to take it. You're gonna absorb more right after the workout with the simple sugars. I got a lot of experience with injuries, man. I had enough injuries over the years. I've learned as I went along. As a young guy, when I started, I got injuries, and there's really no, there was no good advice around. I'd go to my MD, and of course, I don't know much about sports injuries. 
and just tell you to rest and take some anti-inflammatories. If you've got an injury, a small injury, it's good to take care of it. You know, what happens if you've got an injury, if you've got a, a small tear in the muscle, your body will repair that, but it repairs it with scar tissue. Uh, scar tissue is not flexible like normal muscle tissue, it's not elastic. So if you could think about like an elastic band, if you, if you snapped an elastic band and then stuck it together with, with glue, with a lump of glue, it'll, it'll be fixed, but it'll no longer be elastic. And there's a good chance that that lump of glue at some point is gonna snap again. So if you get a little injury, I think deep tissue massage is the best thing uh, to do. Uh, you get somebody in there, break that scar tissue down, bring blood into the area, and trying to get a healthy uh, tissue back there. And do that before it comes, becomes a severe injury. You know? that's, that's what I've learned over the years. And uh, you know, regular chiropractic is very helpful as well to keep everything in balance. Don't wait till you've got an injury. If, you, if you're putting a lot of stress on your body, if you're doing a lot of weight training, I think it's a good idea to have regular chiropractic care, just uh, maybe once a month, something like that. I used to do uh, strength because, I mean, strength is a good indication. If you're getting stronger, you're getting bigger and vice versa. So I would do body weight. I even used to do measurements, like measure my arms. This stuff might sound a bit old, old school, but if you've got various factors there, you can see if they're all increasing. So you could do a couple of measurements. You could do your body weight on the scales. You could do your strength levels and see how that increases from month to month and have a goal each month. Even if this month I'm going to put on two pounds, if you did that every month at the end of the year, it's 24 pounds. It's a huge gain. I didn't do pitches in the off season, but I did getting ready for a contest every week, getting ready for a contest. And that way I could track how my body was changing and actually helped me uh, a lot. When I won the first Mr. Olympia in 1992, I kept that every week pitches. And what I noticed was like practically five or six weeks out from the contest, I was more or less in contest shape. And I kept coming down and losing weight and losing weight. And I may have got a little harder, uh, but what I realized is I, I was actually losing muscle. So the next year I was determined not to do that and I didn't make that mistake. And that's why I was able to make a huge increase from one year to the next, like 16 or 17 pounds of muscle from one year to the next. And everyone's like, wow, how, how is that possible? Well, you know, I had a great year of training, so I probably did put on five or six pounds of muscle, which at a pro level, that's a great gain. Uh, but more importantly, I didn't sacrifice 10 pounds of muscle that I sacrificed the previous year. So it's, it's really helps the learning process. Something that really helped me over the years to keep motivated is uh, keeping a journal with nutrition, with, with training. What I used to do is every month write down where I'm at presently. This is my body weight. This is my nutrition. These are my max weights for eight reps on it's like 10 key exercises. And then I set myself a short term goal, which is like in one month's time, I wanna do this. And it's gotta be an achievable goal. For instance, if you could just add five pounds to your bench press in a month, if you could do that every month, then that's 60 pounds at the end of the year. That's a huge gain. So it's important to have goals, short term goals, maybe monthly goals, and maybe a long term goal at the end of the year and break it down into little steps. Instead of looking at the end of the year, I want to achieve this, how are you going to get there? You've got to take small steps to get there. So monthly goals and writing them down, I think it makes them more, much more powerful. What I would do before a workout, I would look at my journal and I would keep a record of, of every workout as well. After the workout, I would write down, this is what I did today, you know, incline press 200 times eight reps and I would review that before I went to do the workout the next week. And okay, that's what I did last week. And that's my goal to beat this, you know? I did eight reps with 200 or whatever. This, this workout, I'm gonna do nine reps or 10 reps, or I'm gonna do the same reps with 205. Just small increments and get that goal in your mind. Uh, know which exercises you're gonna do before you go to the gym, which order you're gonna do them in what your goals are for, that, uh, for those exercises, rather than just wandering in the gym and thinking, oh, oh, I'm doing chest today. What shall I do? What do I feel like doing today? And having no clear goal. If you've got no clear goal, uh, you're very unlikely to get anywhere.